Hello there, brothers and sisters in Christ. Praise and glory and honour be to God. As you can see today, I've a little bit of laryngitis, I've lost my voice, and I'm not sure how we'll go today. But by God's grace, it gives us opportunity to have a testimony. And the most powerful thing about you is your testimony. And Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father and all his angels. What a stupendous promise. What awesome right hand of fellowship. Brothers and sisters in Sydney and right across this country, we are the most privileged of all people to have been redeemed from darkness and sin and Satan and self into God's glorious light. Praise and glory and honour be to God, for he is good. And we look forward to the completion of our redemption. You know, like little children, we sort of say to God, are we there yet? Lord, hasten the day when our faith is visible, when all that we hope for will transpire. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, we ask the question, are we there yet? We wait for the fullness of the kingdom of God. We wait for Jesus' return. And at the heart and core of the Sabbatarian community, including the Church of God's Seventh Day, really the Grandmother Church, we've always had a sense of expectation of Jesus' coming, his imminent coming, his presence among us, his spirit. And I guess sometimes we do ask the wrong questions. Remember the disciples in Acts chapter 1, I think it's verse 9. They asked Jesus, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, they were looking for the Lion of Judah to give the Romans a good walloping. But instead they got the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. A different kind of victory. And sometimes we know the prophetic word, but we don't know exactly how it'll transpire. But be assured of your salvation. Be assured that you are redeemed. Jesus talked about the age in which he lived, we live, and he says, pray that you may escape these things, those things that's coming on the world, and to stand before the Son of Man. That's very powerful and very reassuring. So you and I are not only redeemed, but we're given a new identity in Christ. You are a new creation. You have been forgiven from your sins. And you've been given the right hand of fellowship, the righteousness of Christ. And Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to what he has done. Wow. There are extraordinary and great promises. And I usually think about them at this time of the year because I look forward to Jesus returning and I look forward to the might and the power of his glory. Now, within the church, we celebrate a memorial annually, the Christ Passover, the, the Lord's Supper. We commemorate his death. When the ancient Israelites celebrated the Hebrew Passover, they did it in relation to their narrative in Egypt the blood on the doorposts, the death angel passing over. But they did not realise what they were celebrating under the terms of the new covenant is a memorial to Christ's death. Where the victory over sin and Satan and self and death was through Jesus' sacrifice, the Lamb of God. And so once a year, we take a small piece of bread we drink from the cup of the fruit of the vine and we wash one another's feet. And Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. He says, for I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So in other words, there's unfinished business. And when we go to Leviticus 23, verse 23, we see that there's another memorial, a memorial proclaimed with a blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. And so... <coughs> 
you and I wrestle another memorial? Now, there's no indication from Leviticus 23 what the ancient Israelites were celebrating. They celebrated the early barley harvest. They celebrated the later wheat harvest. The Passover was their deliverance from Egypt and much of their narrative centred around that. But brothers and sisters, there's a much bigger picture here, a much bigger picture. And we begin to find out what is Leviticus 23, verse 23? What is this memorial of blowing of trumpets? I think it's a good question to ask because we proclaim and celebrate the memorial of Christ's death. But there's another memorial and that is profound. When you turn to the book of Joshua, you recognise that Moses had finished his job. He went up to Mount Nebo and he looked out and Moses was taken, gone. Satan disputed over his body. His job was done. So the first point of conquest for Joshua was to take the city of Jericho. And you read a very unusual instruction by God for this kind of victory. In Joshua chapter 6 verse 13, and the seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord walked on and they blew their trumpets continually. And every day for six days they walked around Jericho blowing their trumpets. And if you read the narrative, on the seventh day, they shouted, the trumpets were blown, and Jericho fell. And you sort of say, God, you do unusual things. You wait until Abraham is a hundred before you give him Isaac. You get Noah to build a big ship to save the animals and the faithful eight people. Everybody has a different story. And for Joshua, what are you doing? Why, God, do you get Joshua to recognize that there is a strategic way of doing it God's way? And you win by blowing trumpets. And we still have questions. What are these trumpets all about? If you've lived through World War II in Europe, like my dad, he was familiar with the were the war sirens. Everybody get into your bunkers. In fact, this week, 10 million Israeli citizens heard the sirens of incoming Iranian war missiles, 180 of them, intention to wreak devastation. And 10 million people went into the underground bunkers and shelters. So a trumpet can be warning, a herald, and when we turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we read where Paul talks about Jesus' return and when the dead are raised. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet sound of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So... This memorial of blowing of trumpets is pointing to an event of Jesus returning. Just like the Passover narrative pointed to a future event of Jesus' death. Now we look back on the Passover event in the Lord's Supper commemoration. We look back on the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But we're still looking forward to that final trumpet. And Jesus returns, and the saints hear his voice and are raised from the grave. Wow! And Paul says, look, encourage one another with those words. The next time we come across trumpets is in the book of Revelation. There are seven trumpets. God's justice on a wicked, sinful world. And you could read it beginning in Revelation chapter 8. And I won't take the time today. My voice is not so strong. Please forgive me. But the first angel, the second angel, the third angel, 
all the way up to six angels who blow their trumpets and God speaks to a wicked generation full of murder, adultery, theft and, and sorcery and people don't repent. And after the sixth trumpet, John eats a little scroll. This scroll is a command for John to go and prophesy again to many nations and peoples and languages. It's a commission of the church to share the good news of Jesus Christ and the imminency of his kingdom. And then then what follows John is the ministry of the two witnesses. Now, there's a lot of discussion of that. We've had some really good Bible studies on that recently. (coughs) Just like Isaiah's ministry in Isaiah 59. Cry aloud, said the Lord. Spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their sins and their transgressions. And so the witness of the church manifested in two olive branches, manifest in the two lampstands picturing the ministry of Moses and Elijah on an unrepented generation. And then we have the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet. The seventh angel blew his trumpet. I'm reading from Revelation 11 verse 15. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And we read the following verses, which is an anthem of praise and of victory. Jesus has come. Victory in the Lamb was completed 2,000 years ago. And now he comes triumphant with a rod of iron to rule the nations, to exact justice, to bring peace on this earth. The central narrative of the biblical story, authored by 40 authors over 1,500 years in 66 books, the central protagonist of the biblical narrative is Jesus Christ. And the central geographical location is the city of peace, Jerusalem. We first hear about Jerusalem with Melchizedek. We hear about Moriah when Abraham took Isaac as a type of exercise of giving up your only son whom you love. Reverberating right down history, the Christology is there. Very powerful. When Jesus returns, he's not going to return to Perth, Western Australia, or Sydney, or Paris, or New York. He's going to return to Jerusalem. Scripture says his feet will specifically touch the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives will split in two. When we see it, will know prophecy has been fulfilled. They're very powerful, very encouraging. Now, I want to share a thought here because in Acts chapter 1 verse 9, we read Jesus' final words to his disciples. They ask, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And so Jesus has a much bigger plan than their small myopic questions. He says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons appointed by the Father. So brothers and sisters, right throughout the biblical narrative, we see the appointed times of the Lord. In fact, every week we celebrate the seventh day Sabbath as an appointed time of the Lord. (coughs) But in Acts, they expected Jesus to give the Romans a good walloping. It didn't happen that way in that time. And when Jesus had said these things, in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So as a boy, I used to look out the window of my dad's car as we'd be driving home from some church celebration and I'd see the fluffy cumulus clouds and the sun's rays coming from behind. 
and I'd see the glory of the evening sky and thinking, will that be like that when Jesus returns? Oh, how I long to see that day when either he calls me up or calls me from the grave. You and I have extraordinary hope. But the reality is, Jesus says, I go and prepare a place for you. He made many other promises. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you to the end of the age. He said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Now, I used to see Jesus as in the past and in the future, but I never valued his imminence. I just said he's in heaven. He's now seated on his Father's throne. And by the Holy Spirit, indwells in us. But when I look at the first century Jesus before he ascended to heaven, he appeared or disappeared several times. Remember on the road to Emmaus? The hearts of those two disciples were burning within them while Jesus expounded from the scriptures all about himself. And when he broke bread at the inn, their eyes were open, they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And later on he appears to the eleven and again to them when Thomas was there. He just appeared in the room. And he says, Thomas, look at my hands, look at my side. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And that's your and my generation. So the capacity for Jesus to appear and to disappear. And this idea, even though Jesus will visibly return and all the nations will mourn on account of his glory, because Babylon has fallen, just like Jericho fell. Paul uses interesting phraseology. Instead of talking about Jesus coming, as John says, even so, come Lord Jesus, Paul talks about his appearing and his revealing. I want to leave you with those scriptures to ponder, because how is it that Jesus can be seated on his Father's throne? Yet he said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And that's a powerful promise. From 1 Timothy 6.4, Paul writes to this young elder to keep the commandments unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't use the word coming. He uses the word appearing. In 2 Timothy 4.1, I charge you, says Paul, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. In other words, the Father knows every hair on our head, and Jesus is building the church, and he's not far from any of us. In fact, the book of Hebrews talks about the connection between Jesus and the physical universe, saying that he sustains the universe by the word of his power. You and I don't realize just the, div the divine authority in heaven and earth given to Jesus. It's so hard from our small state. That's why we ask the wrong questions. Are we there yet? It's a good question. I love our children asking because they're thinking about it. Paul says at the end of his life to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4 verse 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. He wrote to Titus chapter 2 verse 13, Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Christ Jesus. He says the same thing using the word revealing so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we proclaim the imminency and the glory and the expectation of Jesus' coming and he will visibly come and all the nations will mourn an account of him because they don't want him to rule over them. But we will be rejoicing with gladness. For out of the great tribulation, 
many souls will be redeemed. And the darkness and the deception and the lies in this world, the spell on this world, will finally be broken. One day, every knee will bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And this weekend, we think about it, we proclaim it, we talk about it. And we recognize that the prophetic word is much deeper than we can understand. Prophecy is meant to be understood when it happens. When the Lord gave Isaiah this prophecy, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. What do you do with that? You know the Messiah will come from the house of David, Bethlehem. It's all promised. It's all in the scriptures. Because virgins don't conceive. But this way Mary did by the Holy Spirit. And when it happened, then the wise men knew the king was born. Very powerful, very encouraging, and very enlivening and enlightening. And everything in the scriptures that Jesus experienced and is going to happen is written in the scriptures. The challenge that we have is that we don't always understand it. We struggle with it. And, you know, on the road to Emmaus, I mentioned that earlier, those two confused disciples were just so traumatised because Roman crucifixion, nails in the hands, thorns in the head, nails in the feet, and a brutal stab in the abdomen by a Roman spear leaves no doubt for any chance of resuscitation. But Jesus befriends those two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. And he asks them, what are you talking about? And they say, are you the only person in Jerusalem who don't know what's been happening? And so what he does, he says, oh, foolish ones, (coughs) slow slow to understand. And he's talking to us by virtue, as we are disciples as well. And so he explains from all the scriptures, those that testify to why the Christ would suffer. And... Then Jesus disappeared from their sight. And do you know what they did? They were no longer walking away. They had a testimony by Jesus from Moses and all the prophets interpreting from the scriptures everything about Christ. Now you and I are privy to the scriptures. We have concordances. We have technology. I carry the scriptures with me everywhere on the mobile phone. And I listen to it regularly in the car when I'm driving the sound of the word of God being enmeshed and embedded in our hearts. Brothers and sisters, we don't see 100% clearly, but we know Jesus has promised to return. And I want to encourage you not to grow weary in well-doing, not to be beguiled by the age in which we live. This week, 180 cruise missiles headed towards Israel. This is the largest and most protracted attack in Israel and Jerusalem ever in human history. Because the miracle of all miracles was the end of the times of the Gentiles in 1948 when Israel or Palestine was trampled underfoot. It was just desolate. And in 1948, the state of Israel was declared to become a homeland for the Hebrew people. There was war. In 1948, in 1967, and in 1973. But they were quick victories over the many Arab armies that came attacking. But we are facing a different kind of scenario today. Exactly a year ago, on October the 7th, 23, 1,200 Israelis were murdered and 250 were um, taken as hostages. And over 360 days of war have happened. And it's not dying down, it's escalating. Brothers and sisters, Jesus said, pray that you may be worthy to escape these things. That's number one. But number two, to stand before the Son of Man. What a beautiful promise. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And yet, when we read the parables of Jesus... The surprise 
nature of Christ's coming catches everyone unawares, including apparently the body of Christ. The maidens waiting for the groom all fell asleep. Half had let their Holy Spirit drain out, so to speak. That's a shocking statistic. And so we are called to be awake, enlivened in the Spirit, about His good work, immersed in prayer, all the more as we see the day approaching. So on this Sabbath, may God bless, may God encourage you and strengthen us when every word of God will become manifest at the appointed time. So brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, on behalf of the wonderful Church of God's Seventh Day growing here in Australia, I'm your brother, John Classic. Have a wonderful Sabbath.